What's going on ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle and this is another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report Podcast and today we have a really special guest in the building. Listen, this man here is the Director of Venue Operations at Inc. Entertainment. Inc. Entertainment is Canada's largest lifestyle and entertainment company. You know who we have in the building today? We have Mr. Oren Bristol in the building today. What's going on, Big Boss? Well, first, I'm going to make sure that you introduce me all the time. <laughs> when I go to parties, when I go to dinners, that's what I'm going to have, because that was wonderful. Yeah. That makes me feel good. Yeah, well, come on. I'm You're good. supposed to, man. You're I'm supposed good. to feel good, Or <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, listen, things are good. Uh, the world is different right now, and uh, we're just trying to figure out how to you know, navigate that. That's yeah. really what's happening at this point. Yeah, and it's everything is like sudden. It just one day you woke up, and everything changed. Literally, and I'll tell you, for for, for me, the funny thing is that uh, I went on vacation with my family mm-hmm. the week that they were shutting it down. So literally, yeah. I, um, we were open on a Saturday night at the club, yeah. and everything was packed. And then the next day I was leaving on vacation, and I came back and it was a ghost town. Everything was a ghost town. So while I was away in Jamaica with the family, I'm getting messages, I'm on emails, I'm on the phone, and we're just getting this information about the shutdown. And originally we thought it would be a couple of weeks. That's what everybody thought. Yeah. Everybody thought that. Wow. But now here we are like, what What are we about? Five months in? Four months? We're five months in. Yeah. This yeah. is crazy. Wow. Before we even go down that road, let's get into your background a bit here. Mr. Oren Bristol, all right? We know you're the Director of Venue Operations, Inc. Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Entertainment is something that's been in your blood. How long have you now been in the entertainment field and what actually got you into the entertainment field? I would say that we're probably looking at around 26 years at this point, 26, 27 years. Okay. Um, I started while I was in school, when I was going to school, and I was working as a security guard because it was the easiest job to do okay. um, and still get my studies done. I was working as a security guard in a building, like an overnight security guard. Um, and then somebody that I was uh, at the gym, gym with training said, hey, we need some people to work in the nightclub. And that's how I started to get into the nightclub business. I moved here mm-hmm. when I was 26 years old, moving here to Toronto, that is. Yeah. And when I was in Toronto, I got a job at a club called Limelight, um, which is uh, only the older people will know, but it's called <laughs> The Rocking Horse now. It's a cowboy bar. Yeah. But I started to work at Limelight, and um, that's the guy that gave me my first opportunity. And it kind of went from there. I mean, uh, they eventually gave me a chance to be an assistant manager at Limelight. Mm -hmm. And then they made me the general manager at System Sound Bar, which is another venue downtown some people may know of. Mm -hmm. From System Sound Bar, I went to Circa. And uh, You were at Circa. I ran Circa. Because Circa wasn't around for a long time, but the impact of Circa and how it looked and operated was mind-blowing. Yeah, it was it was next level. It was yeah. uh, it was probably the first time I felt in my career that I was learning something new, yeah. um, because everything was next level. It was about the show. It was about it was about it wasn't just about people coming and partying and getting them in there, but it was what were you going to give them when you were there. And uh, there was an incredibly creative team there, led mm-hmm. by uh, one Mr. Peter Gation, okay. who is uh, a legendary club owner and operator from the States, and uh, it really showed me something different. Unfortunately, as you said, it wasn't there for very long. Yeah. And after a couple of years, a lot of people and a lot of investors um, started to kind of try to turn the creative aspect off and just go for the money. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter stepped out, and I left shortly after that because Mr. Charles Caboose, who is uh, the gentleman I work for at Inc. Entertainment, Mm -hmm. gave me a call and asked me to come see him for breakfast. And... 11 years later, I'm still with the company. Wow, it's been 11 years with Inc., eh? 11 years. And what was that initial call like from Charles? Because if people don't understand who Charles is, Charles is the CEO of Inc. Entertainment. And when you say Charles in certain circles, people's ears really perk up. You know, Charles is uh, is a visionary. Mm-hmm. He, um, I mean, a lot of people who watch uh, are watching your podcast might know Club Z. Charles started Club Z when he was a 20-something-year-old man, and that's what he opened up. That was his first venue. I didn't know that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that company now has grown to, um, you know, 
hotels, restaurants, nightclubs, day clubs. Um, there are his brands are in uh, Miami. They're talking about opening brands in 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 in, in LA. Mm -hmm. You know, there's got brands in the in the in the UAE. Um, he's going global, and that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And what was it like actually the first day you stepped into that organization? Or even before that, what was a breakfast meeting like when Charles actually reached out to you? So up to that point, uh, I won't call them a competitor, but we were always on opposite sides of the fence. Okay. Um, in the end, when we were doing things, you were going against the government at the time. You were going against... Uh, what they did mm -hmm. at System Soundbar when we started to do electronic music, the government was always known for their electronic music nights. Mm -hmm. So anything we had on Saturday was the people that weren't going there. We were competing to get those people at, at our venues, mm -hmm. and they were the well-established ones. They were the big boys in the city. They were the monsters. They had been here for the longest, and they had the biggest and most resources. So we were going against them. And so when I got this call and I sat down with them, it was. It was a little bit intimidating. Okay. I knew who he was, and I'd spoken to him once or twice, but we'd never had a real conversation. And, uh, I mean, I sat at the table, and he said, well, this is what I'm looking to do. This is what I'm looking for you to do, mm -hmm. and are you interested in this? Uh, we talked a few more things about, you know, what the future held and what his vision was. And, um, you know, he just kept on saying, I'm, I'm going to be doing more. Mm -hmm. I need more people. I need good people. I need people who can run a business like it's their business. Mm -hmm. And, and that was the thing that struck me, um, was the fact that he was looking for somebody to take ownership because he wanted to grow and wanted to be bigger. Mm. And uh, that's, as I said, it's kind of the beginning of what was now where we are now. Yeah, wow. And when you stepped in, what job title were you offered at first? I mean, at first, the, the title was Director of Venue Operations. Okay. But I think at first, it was more so the General Manager of the Government. The reality is that Charles needed somebody to fix the issues that were happening at the government, which mm -hmm. was his flagship, mm -hmm. and he needed it to be brought together and cost-controlled and just kind of be able to take it because he was working on other projects. Mm -hmm. I think that the director of venue operations was more of a carrot dangled. Because in the beginning, yeah. it was, okay, don't worry about those things. Just yeah. just take care of this. Take Got care it. of the government. Deal with the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was pretty, I was involved in meetings, but I was pretty hands-off with, you know, This Is London at the time and Ultra at the time, you know, Tattoo Rock Parlor at the yes. time. I didn't do a lot of stuff with those venues. He wanted me to fix government. But the great thing is that it probably took me about six, seven months to get my feet under me and get running. It wasn't mm -hmm. automatic at all. Yeah. I lost more money than I made in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I realized, or when I realized I was going to stay with the company, I remember I lost a bunch of money on, um, we did Blackstar and Movado. And we did them one night after another, or one week after another. Okay. And both of them were amazing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't make money. We broke even on Blackstar. Mm -hmm. um, and Movado wasn't promoted the way we should have promoted it. Got you. And I think we did like 1400 on Movado. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, we lost money. I think I lost around 25 grand. And, you know, I, I called him and asked him if we can have a meeting. And I went to his office on Monday and I sat down and I said, Charles, you know, I'm sorry. It's, it's uh, you know, I lost this money. And, you know, I, I, I understand that you're probably upset. And, I mean, I had called the meeting. He hadn't called the meeting. Yeah. And he said, listen, Oren, you tried. And all I'm asking is that you try. I see the work you put in. I see you tried. Just next time, try harder yeah. and make sure you control your costs. And that's it. You learn from this mistake and we go forward. And that's when I realized that I had somebody I was working with who would give an opportunity. And when you have that from mm -hmm. the person that you're working for, when you have the person you're working for say, it's okay to lose, I see you worked hard and I see you wanted it to work. I see where you thought it was going to work. Yeah. That's everything. For sure. Because that leaves the door open for you to try and do. And as long as you win more than you lose, he's good. 
And that's what the situation's been. For sure. And that's really the bottom line there. You said when you got into the government complex, and this is the legendary go- government complex that no longer exists. I think they put up on condos, condos or something, something condos. there. <laughs> All right. Should have bought, didn't buy. Should have <laughs> bought, didn't buy. <laughs> you live and you learn. Yep. What were some of the issues that were actually happening in government at that time where they wanted to control whatever the situation was? The government was very big, Mm -hmm. and Charles was absent. So Charles, although he had other managers there, uh, in the early days, he was there all the time. He would get there in the morning. He would be there in the evening. He would oversee the promoters. He'd oversee the bartenders, the hiring. He would oversee it all. And what happens is that when it's your baby and you're overseeing it, you make sure that the brand is a certain way. For sure. When people come, they see a brand. What had happened is that that brand had been let slip because he was now dealing with, this is London. He was working on another project. He had something in Yorkville he was dealing with. And he left that to other people who weren't treating it like it was their own. So when it came in, I mean, not all the staff was right. Uh, The place was dirty. It hadn't been getting cleaned properly. And then the, just just the overruns of expenses. I mean, you know, if you have staff that should be working for five hours, coming in and punching in early, and now they're working for seven hours, you're paying 20% more than you should for staffing. Right off the top. If you have suppliers coming in and, you know, nobody's watching what they're charging you, and you should be paying, you know, $5 for, for toilet paper, but you're paying $7 for toilet paper, Right off the top, 40%. Yeah. yeah. Right? And if you have an inventory and a place like the government that can fit back in the day three, 4,000 people you're doing in that venue in different rooms, you had the cool house, the sky bar, you, you have all these rooms, mm-hmm. that's a lot of vodka. That's a <laughs> lot of rum. Yeah, yeah. And if somebody's not counting that properly and making sure that what you buy minus what you sell is what you have left in inventory... That's a lot going out the door. Uh, Things go missing very quickly. Things go missing, all right? And so that's part of what was happening. Mm -hmm. The brand wasn't being respected. The club wasn't being maintained. The staff were not happy. When staff were not happy, they steal. Mm -hmm. And what were they stealing? They're stealing the booze, the alcohol, the things that you make money on. Mm -hmm. That was what's happening. All right. And then you went in and then you fixed up. And you said it took about six months to really get going? It took six months for me to understand the government. Got you. Okay. It, it wasn't, uh, I mean, although I was at Circa, which was a big venue, I was at Circa from the beginning. So everything that was in place was what I put in place. The team was my team. Yeah. I went into the government and it was a new team. It was new people, new bartenders. And you don't go in and just fire everybody. That's not the way to do things. Mm-hmm. So it took me time to learn the venue, to learn how the venue worked, to learn who were the right people and the wrong people. And... It took me six months to understand. It probably took me another nine months to a year to fix the issues that were issues, mm-hmm. to, to turn the numbers around and get them in the right direction. And that had to do with just getting the right team on board. I mean, it's, it's I'm one man. I can't do it. You have to have some of the right bartenders, the right managers. Then you have to empower some of the people that were there that want to do a good job but didn't have a chance to do that before. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense because the word you said was empower. That's really the key there. For me, give somebody the power to help out and do their part, then they'll, they'll be more invested in the actual brand itself instead of just being there for a paycheck. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. really what it comes down to. Well, okay, so you've been in the entertainment scape now about 24 years now? Well, I mean, 26 years in the city, but yeah, yeah about 26, 26, 27 years yeah. I've been and in this. How have you seen the landscape change for nightclubs over that period of time? Well, Toronto, when I first came here, and I think probably still now, and I I remember seeing this uh, statistic way back when, and it's probably still the case, Mm -hmm. Toronto has more dance club space per capita than any city in North America. Okay. What that means is that for the amount of people who live here, there's more dance floors than the people who live in New York, LA, or Miami. We have more clubs, more space. Yeah. There's a lot of competition. Mm-hmm. Back in the beginning, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when Richmond Street and Adelaide Street were the hubs, and that's where the, the club core was, yeah. everybody and anybody was opening up a nightclub. 
So they're operators, people who've been doing it for a long time, and there's several in the city that are, you know, legitimate guys, and they've been here forever. Mm -hmm. And then there are guys who, you know, had successful businesses elsewhere, but they wanted to be nightclub guys. Everybody wants to be a nightclub owner, or they think they do. Yeah. You know, you you get some money, you get a space, 200 people, now you're there, and it's the alcohol and the partying and the girls, and you're talking about how every time you go out on the weekend with your seven or eight friends, you guys always spend a couple of thousand dollars, and why can't they just spend it at your place? Well, your friends don't want to spend thousands of dollars at your place. They want it for free at your place. Uh-huh. And if you're going to be an owner operator and you know nothing about this business, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to operate properly and you don't know about cost cutting. And all you're thinking about is the party and the glamorous life. And those people lost their money. And uh, a lot of those places closed. Mm -hmm. Then the city started to crack down and said too many spaces, too many people not operating properly. And they really started to get tight on nightclubs. And it really started to start to filter out the guys that were just kind of operating by the seat of their pants. Toronto's a very expensive city. Mm-hmm. Rents kept on going up. Yeah. And uh, it had weeded out most of the people who didn't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, by and large, a lot of the people who are here now are good at what they do. The city does not give out large licenses anymore. So you can't get a license for 1,000 people, 2,000 people in the city. It's near to impossible. Yeah. Unless it's a pre-existing license. Like if you're grandfathered in or something like that, then you just sell it to somebody else and they do what they're doing, renovate, exactly. whatever the case is. But you can't build a place now and say to the city, hey, I want a license for 2,000 people, 2,500 people. Doesn't exist. Won't happen anymore. Not happening. Wow. And again, for the last 20 plus years now, you've been in the entertainment space. How hard has it been to actually get an urban night up and running and even maintain an urban night? I'll tell you, back in, um, I remember we opened up System Sound Bar in 1999. Mm And in 2001, I went to the owners and I said, I think we have an opportunity to start a night. We can do a hip hop night. It was an EDM club or it was an electronic club. Uh, We had you know, uh, Friday, Saturday, electronic night. We had a Wednesday jungle night. We had a Thursday, which was a techno night, and the techno night was not working well. Mm -hmm. And we had a one-off rental where these kids came in over the holidays, and they did this night, some young kids from the beaches. And the night was amazing. It was a hip-hop night. It was an amazing night. And I went to them and said, hey, should we do this? Can we do this? Before this, in the clubs... If the DJ on any given night played more than two or three hip hop songs, never mind reggae, yeah. forget reggae. We're going to get there, Justin. Forget <laughs> reggae. Not happening. Yeah. Unless it was Shaggy. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't me. That's it. <laughs> but if he played more than two or three hip hop songs in a row, mm-hmm. the owner or the manager would run down to the DJ, yell at the DJ, tell him to take that off, don't play that. Mm-hmm because they weren't allowed to do it. They played Euro beats and Geno beats and whatever, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, they played dance music. And it was because a lot of the clubs were afraid. They did not want an urban crowd. Okay. They did not want a black crowd. Fair enough. Okay. Um, and technically, they didn't want anybody else. They didn't want an Asian crowd. They didn't want a, an Indian crowd. They didn't want anybody. They yeah. wanted uh, a, a young, white, European crowd that they felt would come and drink and spend money. And so when we asked to start this hip-hop night, we sat down and talked about it. And, you know, the owners of the club at the time were Greek. And uh, it wasn't necessarily what they were looking to do. But they they talked about it. The only regular urban night in the city at that point mm-hmm. was at Phoenix on Sunday night. Uh, I think it's is, is Planet Rock or Planet Vibe. Um, I don't remember. I know that was over there. That was uh, fully loaded. They were playing, and those type of guys, those type of DJs were over exactly. there playing. Mm-hmm. And they were live to air on a radio station. But it was the only one. It's the yeah. only regular weekly urban night at a mainstream club mm-hmm. in the city. And so we started this Thursday, which was Super Funk Thursdays. And um, that night started with 200 people, and it ended up doing 16, 1,700 people. Never any big issues, never any big problems. And at that point is when, I mentioned before how so many clubs, there were so many clubs in the city, too many clubs, not enough people. And so what happened, 
not because of us by any means, but what happened just out of necessity yeah. is club owners started to give up nights to urban promoters because they couldn't fill it. Yeah. They couldn't fill it with the you know, Greeks and Italian kids who everybody wanted. They mm -hmm. came, they spent money, they, you know, they are spending money. They couldn't fill it with the young kids from the burbs who was what they wanted in their clubs. Mm -hmm. And so they started reaching out to different promoters to fill their clubs because they had to stay open. They couldn't stay open, they couldn't make money. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that often many of those promoters back in those days would find themselves in a situation where they were treated as second-class citizens. So a club would open up mm -hmm. and they would have an urban night, but they took away the straws. There were no straws <laughs> on the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Save. They took away the napkins. They didn't use any fruit. Yeah. They raised the prices, you know. Um, they forced everybody to go to code check. These are the little things that they did to try to make a little bit more money and it was because they didn't want you there. They had no choice but to have you there. I see, because that's a big difference between, because remember, at the end of the day, once you're a businessman, you want to make money. But if you can't make it with the crowd that you think you're going to make, you still want to continue doing business. So, okay, let's try these guys here and see what happens. Yes. Back then, what was the issue with the urban crowd, why they didn't want them, or the black crowd, why they didn't want them in the clubs? Or was there an issue, or was it a perceived issue back then? I think it was a perceived issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, we, uh, you know, we, we have issues uh, with everybody, with every crowd. Mm -hmm. There's issues, but people didn't know. Mm -hmm. They weren't sure, and they didn't have enough owners. They didn't have enough people. When you don't know something, when it's strange for you, you, you have these preconceived notions, you assume, you believe, mm -hmm. you know, th there are very few clubs, you know, 10 years from that time, by the time you got to 2011, that didn't have an urban night, you okay. know? Um, and today, everybody has an urban night. Um, urban music, hip hop music plays at every club. Yeah. It's just part of what we do. And it's part of what the mainstream is. There's nothing more mainstream than that music. But at that time, that music was not a music that they wanted. And they figured, okay, this is going to scare my crowd away. And I don't want too many people. And mm -hmm. what are the issues? And what do I have to deal with? And, and it's just, it's the unknown. It's the unknown. And if you don't have somebody who is bringing it to the table properly, then people just don't know. And if they don't know, they react, yeah. you know? And, and um a lot of people don't understand the difference between the word racism and prejudice. It's prejudice. Yeah. I'm prejudging what's going to happen when these people are here. Yeah. I don't know, but I'm prejudging it. That's mm -hmm. what prejudice is. Yeah. And there was a lot of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, um, and it wasn't just the black community because nobody wanted uh, anybody from the Asian community there and they didn't want anybody from the Indian community there. Okay. Nobody who had their own parties, nobody who had a cultural party just focusing on their own community mm -hmm. could get a venue, especially on a main night. You would have to go on the outskirts and do something in, in a banquet hall or a restaurant or whatever it may be. Yeah. You'll get a Wednesday night at the club where nobody's coming, but here's a night off. You try it out. Anyhow. There you go. There you okay. Go. Urban, we're talking about that's more hip hop, R&B and stuff. Let's get to reggae now. Let's get to reggae. All right. How did the reggae scene actually come up in the clubs where you were involved? Where what actually made you say, okay, you know what, let's give it a chance to see how this turns out. Do you remember the DJs or promoters or even the night? I'll tell you that nobody came to me while I was at System Sound Bar and asked for a reggae night. Okay. And nobody ever came to me at Circa. So the first time, although I knew reggae promoters, the mm -hmm. first time I dealt with reggae promoters or just reggae as a music on a regular basis was at the government. Okay. And so at the government, I mean, and, and once again, when you're talking about a urban night and you're having hip hop nights, even at System Soundbar, the DJ is playing reggae. It's part of the format. Yeah. You know, the 20 minute reggae set's going to happen, mm -hmm. but there were no reggae promoters and it was a reggae, you know, uh, it, it was, it was, it was reggae that was being played and that was going to be the majority of the music format that night. Mm -hmm. 
When I went to the government, I started to meet a lot of people, and a lot of people came and saw me. Um, you know, among those people, you know, uh, the guys from um, Squingy and them. Oh, Reggae Cafe. Reggae Cafe came yeah. to see me. Uh, White Boy came to see me. Uh, we did some business. Um, you know, shortly after I went there, um, Steeny came to see me. We did a lot of stuff. Realistically, I think it was more so Soka first. Okay. Because it was Dr. J was in there right away, and we started doing business right away. And that kind of opened the doors to everybody else because some of those guys played on his parties, mm -hmm. and those guys would come and talk to me. And there would be introductions made, so on and so forth. But those are the guys that I kind of started to deal with from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it kind of went from there. Ian Wilshire was there, Caravana Weekend, mm -hmm. you know. And But once you start to do that, I mean, although we did do Caravana parties at Circa and a few at at System Soundbar, most of those were once again just hip-hop, not Got really reggae-based guys. Mm -hmm. And you being the black directors of Operation were you the one signing off on these reggae events so it's basically your neck is on the line if anything happens at any of these events or what kind of position did that put you in? Well, I mean, the name of the position is not the Black Director of Operations, but <laughs> <laughs> I was a Director of Operations and I was black. Yeah. And so that was never said, but my job was to take care of this venue as it was my own. And that included bookings. Okay. And so whether I was booking all ages events or events with uh, some Italian promoters, same thing. Yeah. When I'm booking it with, you know, hip hop promoter or a reggae promoter or a soca promoter, mm -hmm. I'm taking responsibility. That being said, mm -hmm. of course, it's more on my shoulders. As we all know. Yeah. Okay. We are black men and women. We know that the responsibility the weight is always on your shoulders. For sure. You're representing everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom told me when I was growing up that um, the difference between me and the young blonde kid beside me, we can have the same marks, we can do the same work, but if I want to get to the same place, I will have to work three times as hard. You understand. I understood it from when I was young. Mm -hmm. My mother told me that when I was growing up and, you know, me and my friends were going to play basketball or going on a team. And if we're all sitting in the back of that bus and there are three white guys and three black guys and three Asian guys, and we start making noise, when people turn around, they're looking at me. Yeah. No matter who is making the noise. Mm -hmm. And so growing up with that, you understand that. That becomes part of who you are. And so when I was dealing with people who wanted to do work, at the venue, I knew mm -hmm. that no matter who I brought in, they were going to be representing all of the community and all the promoters. So I've tried my best to work with people who are professional, mm -hmm. who had good reputations, and um, I continue to work with the same people over and over again. I mean, people who know me, people have complained, and you know, you don't give me a chance. I, I, you know, I, I don't need to work with everybody. Mm -hmm. I just need to work with the right ones. Yeah. That makes sense because the trick with it is I remember when we were actually doing promotion and stuff. I met you in government and we came to book Orange Room. What I liked with you, you were always 100% straight, 100% professional. But because of representation, you made the process a lot easier. For me, as a black guy going into this big, oh, it's a government where thousands of people go, how am I going to get my foot in? But dealing with you always made it a hundred times more better. Again, it wasn't because it was any favors or anything. It was just the professionalism and you understood. And that's really what it came down to was understanding. I, I think so. And, and I think that really part of it is that when you speak to people whose parents have had the same conversations with them growing up, you don't even have to say it. For sure. You know. You've got young people who are hungry for an opportunity mm -hmm. who've never had a chance. I've got a boss who says, do the right things, treat it like it's your own, and make it make sense. And now I've got an event that if this person is doing it properly and it brings the people to the table, I know it's going to make money. It's the best of all worlds. And yes, it opens doors for people. Mm -hmm. And yes, it shows... Um, 
that many people can do events and do events properly and professionally. And some of those events, especially in the last years of the government, are some of the best events. Okay, uh, it's important for it's important for us to understand that your dollars mean something. Yeah, a lot of times, black promoters. Promoters who are just not part of the mainstream mix of it, they're made to feel like somebody's doing you a favor by allowing you to do the event in their space. Yes. When in reality, quite often, if you do your business properly and you can bring the numbers you say you're going to bring mm-hmm. and those people drink what they're supposed to drink, it's you that is helping the venue out. It's a two-way street. And unfortunately, many promoters in our business have been made to feel, even when the operator knows you're benefiting them, like if they're being done a favor. And so, once again, you're being treated like a second-class citizen. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the issue. Yeah, definitely. And especially being in somewhere multicultural like Toronto, where you have everything going on, you have seven nights a week, all type of parties going on. It's you really want to feel when you go to a venue that they're respecting you as a person first, and a business before who the color of my skin. And that's really important. And as I said, representation, you going into Warren's office, you know, okay, as long as your business is right, as long as that's the what a lot of people don't realize, as long as your business is right, Warren will deal with you. Absolutely. You know I mean? And I'm not going to deal with you just because you're black. What do I care? Understand. Worse, Mm -hmm. worse for me to do you a favor just because of the color of your skin. Because you're going to mess it up for the next dude who's getting his stuff done properly. Yeah. Okay? As long as it's right. Just like I would deal with anybody else whose business is right. And And that's all people want. That's all they ask. Agreed. And you being around for so long, you understand how it is and you understand how people would feel. So you try your best to make them feel comfortable. You're doing proper business, so let's do it. Yeah. You understand. Wow. Spoke about the government, a legendary Toronto venue, all right? When it closed down and went to Rebel now, all right, what was the biggest difference you found was the operations of Rebel versus a government? The government was this legend, um, this Canadian legend. Actually, it was known around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of massive DJs, a lot of artists. Like, there's so many people who've played in that venue. But... I came in on the tail end, okay? Um, The glory days were done. Okay. What it was is that I had to use some uh, duct tape and uh, (laughs) and then some spit and hold it together, just keep it together uh, until Charles' next evolution came. And so although it was my baby at the time and it was this big monster of a club, it was was new. I, I had missed the glory days. Got you. I didn't go as a customer because I was working at the same time anyways. Mm -hmm. I'd been there, I worked once or twice, I'd been there to see shows, but I wasn't there in the glory days. Mm -hmm. Rebel, I got to be there as part of the, I got to be there in the conception of it. I got to sit in the boardroom and listen and hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got to argue and debate, no, this should go here. No, the bar should be here. No, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, I got to, once again, I told you that was the, when I worked for Circa was the first time I learned anything. Mm -hmm. Working for Charles is the second time I learned things that I didn't know before because I was in a situation where, you know, when you build something that big, mm-hmm. you can't just say bar, 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 dance floor, DJ booth. You got to say, people are entering this way. How many people can you enter in how much time? Where are they exiting? Where's the fire exits? How high should the bar be? How high should the steps be? Okay. How high should the stage be? How will people see from the back of the room? What are we going to do when there's a concert? What are we going to do when there's a corporate? What are we going to do when it's a nightclub? What are we going to do when it's a different kind of nightclub? Okay. All of those things have to be taken into consideration. Mm-hmm. Okay? We're building the biggest venue in the city. What do you do with a venue that can fit that many people? How do you get people to stay in the back? Yeah. You know? And it's one of my favorite stories because people love the view. I mean, the Rick Cabana is successful because people look out and they see the skyline of Toronto. Crazy. And we had, I mean, Cabana, this is eight years of Cabana right now. But Rebel is only three years now. Okay. Okay. This is our, our Rebel's fourth year. And, and how do you get those people 
to be in the back? Why would you want to be in the back? Yeah. And what he came up with was to make the whole back wall of the building glass. Yeah. And so now, the one thing, when you see Cabana, when you Google Cabana, when you look at Cabana, more than any DJ, more than any bottle service girls or bikinis or pool, you see the skyline. People stand and they take that picture. Now, inside Rebel in January, you have the opportunity to still take that picture with the skyline behind you because the whole back wall is glass. Yeah. Most of that wall actually is collapsible and it can move open so it's a big movable patio that you can move around. Okay. And just thinking about that, thinking about that when we hadn't even poured an ounce of concrete, how do you get people in the back of the building so that they'll want to be in the back of the room and they won't feel like this is the worst place to be? Yeah. Those are the things you learn when you're doing something from scratch. Yeah. And Rebel is that monster. I think it's probably one of the craziest clubs I've ever been. The only club I could think that seemed somewhere close to that, and this was on a mini scale, would have been Circa. Yeah. Because Circa had the elevator, not the elevator, escalator, escalator inside and all of those stuff there. So then when I went back to Rebel, because I was there when it was Sound Academy and stuff, yep. when I went back, not Rebel, this was okay. <laughs> you guys you guys are serious over here now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people talk about the renovation of Sound Academy, but we didn't really renovate it. We we took the building down. Yeah. We ra- we literally raised the roof yeah. so it would be higher ceilings. You know, we added where that balcony is on the mez. It's mm-hmm. Sound Academy. That was just a glass wall where people could look out. Yeah. So we had to add a balcony. That thing is elevated and that was never there before. We created mm-hmm. space in the air that wasn't there. <laughs> you know, those rings that come down are astounding. I mean, I'll tell you, it's it's funny. One of the things my wife said, mm-hmm. um, probably two years in, two-year anniversary or something, I sent her a video and she said, Oren, you've sent these videos of these rings right. like 30, 40 <laughs> times. Like, it's the same thing you're sending. Is there an artist on stage or something? Yeah. Like, no, but look at these rings. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, they're crazy. And, and it's wonderful to be able yeah. to go to work two, three years in and still be amazed at what you see because it is so next level. Yeah. You know, it is so next level. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's the, the difference. That's the difference is that I'm still excited. It still makes me excited going to work to see that place. We're in our third year and I walk around and I still walk around in wonder. Yeah. And I've done this for a long time. I've, I've been in a lot of places. I've, I've gone to Ibiza. I've gone to Vegas. I've gone to Miami. I've seen clubs. Yeah. There's nothing like this. Yeah. There's nothing like this. I mean, um, I went to Vegas. I took my wife to Vegas for our anniversary last year. And, um, and uh, I, I, somebody hooked me up with a guy there that, you know, a guy who ran some clubs. So we went to a couple of different places and Migos was playing there. Okay. And, you know, we went to see them play at one of the clubs and nothing on us. Nothing on us. The DJs have nothing on our DJs. The no. DJs are terrible. No. The vibe was terrible. Mm-hmm. People weren't dancing. The club was, it was a nice club, but, mm-hmm. you know. Not no rebel. Not a rebel. Yeah. Not a rebel. And that's amazing there because I remember it was a big deal when rebel was coming around. And you said this is the third year for rebel. Yeah. Going on to fourth. And this is eight years for Cabana. Cabana. Yeah. So then it was all one complex. So there was rebel at the end. Cabana, and is there anything else in that complex there also? Well, listen, we have the other small rooms. Noir is the place that people know. The solarium is now Noir, and that's part of what it is. But it's Rebel and it's Cabana. At first, when it was just Sound Academy, I mean, Sound Academy used to be the docks. And for people who've been here for a long time, the docks had an infamous patio. On Sundays, they'd use these crazy parties. They'd be 10,000 people. It was insane. It was another one of those insane nights. And then when the docks turned to Sound Academy, it became more of a concert venue. And then when... The owners made a deal, and we ended up buying that as Sound Academy. Right away, it was to do Cabana. We did Cabana right away, and that was Charles's vision, to do this outdoor patio, very Miami kind of feeling place. And -hmm. and honestly, we didn't know it would be this successful. Uh, The numbers that we forecasted, we were way above those numbers. That's not what we we intended it to be. We were hoping, oh, you know, maybe we'll do 16, 1,700 people on Saturdays and yeah. we'll do 2,000 on Sundays. And it's been wildly successful. Yeah. Um, and part of that success is that it's seasonal. It's Toronto. So yeah. 
every May, June, it's brand new again. Yeah. People are excited, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. You don't get time to get, you don't get a chance to get used to it and bored with it. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it's been exciting. And, and that's, I guess, the difference. It's that to have this outdoor, indoor thing, and both of them are premier venues in this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, people coming from the States, premier venues. You know, artists come through. You know, we've had almost everybody on that stage, and all of them have been like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I watched Cardi B. She's been on that stage three times, and every time she's like, this is amazing. This is amazing. And it's not just the thing that she's hyping up the crowd, because backstage she's saying the same thing. Yeah. This venue is crazy. I love this venue. And, and I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. Quavo did the same thing. He said the same thing. Everybody says the same thing. The venue is astounding, and um, it's very impressive. Yeah, you guys hit it on the mark when you decided, like, this is the vision. This is how we plan on executing, and you guys did it. Yeah. yeah. All right. But now this is where everything changes now. We're in 2020. <sighs> All right. Middle of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. With Ink Entertainment, I know you guys, I think you guys have, I think, 15 or 16 buildings mm-hmm. and a couple of venues. Yeah. All right. Yeah. When pandemic started, how did that affect the business? I'll tell you, um, panic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. I mean, once again, after we realized it wasn't going to be a month, mm-hmm. you know, after it became real, it became real for everybody because... You know, what people don't realize is that uh, regardless of if we're open or not, we still have to pay rent, still have to pay insurance, okay? Um, We've got a staff of over 2,000 people working, um, which the company kept on board for a period. Um, And you still have mortgages to pay. You have to pay everything. The bank is still waiting. The landlords are still waiting, no matter what. There's several places that closed down because they couldn't handle it and mm-hmm. uh, they weren't ready. And I guess in times like this is you're going to get to see or we got to see which venues were real and they were real companies and they had money put away that they could deal with this. And there are people who were just flying by the seat of their pants. And mm-hmm. if you're flying by the seat of your pants, you weren't going to survive. You know, um, we talked about different things and, and, and you know, once again, um, the vision, mm-hmm. Charles and the team that we have on board, is they came up with when they said we were going to let people go on patios again. Okay. And, and and they didn't say it right away, but we saw it happening in the States and in other countries. Europe was doing it, and it seemed like Canada was following suit with a lot of those things. And in Europe, um, they were letting people back on patios to eat with yeah. distancing. And the owners sat down and made a decision that we were going to do um, what amounts to around a $200,000 renovation, $200,000 worth of work, not renovation, worth of work, prepping Cabana in the assumption and the hope that the city would say, you can open up patios and you can serve food. Cabana is a restaurant and it's a day club. It's known as a day club, but we've always served food. Okay. And there's a full-on kitchen there. Yeah. So... They, they rolled the dice, and fortunately, the city did say, yes, if you're a restaurant with distancing, you can do this. Mm-hmm. And so now the biggest day party in the country has converted to the biggest restaurant in the country. Um, you know, we have everybody seated between 6 and 10 feet apart. Yeah. And we're able to sit around 400 people at a time. Okay. We didn't know how this would work, but we are we are slammed. You cannot get reservations. If you go right now on open table and try to make a reservation for Saturday, yeah. you can't get it because there's 1,200 reservations ready for Saturday. And this is for Cabana? This is for Cabana Waterfront Patio, which is a restaurant. Yeah. It so, is just a restaurant. So you guys aren't doing the um, the parties and stuff right now at Cabana? No, sir. We are open seven days a week. Yeah. Every day except Monday. Okay. We're open from noon till 11 p.m. On uh, Monday, we're open from 3 till 11 p.m. Mm-hmm. And we have lobster Mondays, uh, dinner and a movie on Tuesday. We have uh, we have a barbecue night on Wednesday. You know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is just it's just slammed. And we haven't had a day off. My team yeah. hasn't had a day off. That's crazy how quickly you have to pivot 
and make it happen. But again, you guys pivoted in hopes of this happening. There was no, okay, yes, it's going to happen. We're <laughs> hoping. And again, you're not spending, okay, we'll spend $1,000, $3,000, $50,000 to get this done. No, you guys went all the way in hopes that this happens. Because again, I know it seems like if it didn't work out, you guys were willing to pivot again into whatever would have made it happen. And, and that's exactly it. Listen, we knew that they were going to make an announcement and then they're going to say four days later, you can open. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't get Cabana ready in four days. Yeah. You know, uh, it's an outdoor space. It, it it has to, you know, it was winterized. You've got to sand everything. You've got to stain everything. You've got to, you know, you got to take care of the patio stones. You've got to repaint everything. You've got to get new furniture because, of course, we were a club before and now you need so people can eat dinner. Yeah. So you need proper tables and chairs. And so we had to get a bunch of stuff that we didn't have. And as I said, that was a $200,000 roll of the dice mm -hmm. uh, before we opened the doors. And yeah. then they let us know on a Monday, hey, you guys can open up on Thursday. And, right. <laughs> and you're ready. And, and we were ready. You're ready. Let's you're go. Ready. We were one of the first people who were ready. Yeah. And, you know, the view and and, 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 and you put it out there and people said, yeah, yeah, Cabana. Yeah. And in the beginning, it was more so our regular customers who came out. Mm -hmm. And people thought it was going to be a club. Yeah. And then you got to go and say, sir, you got to sit down. And no, there's no dancing. Yeah. And there's no DJ from, you know, Monday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's just a playlist. It's a Spotify playlist. And then when the DJ is here, he's playing, but the, it's low. You can talk. You yeah. can have a conversation. And he's not playing what you want him to play necessarily. He's just playing <laughs> restaurant stuff. There's no turn up. There's three songs yeah. and then it's something else. You know, yeah. it's a little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll, a little bit of just hip hop, a little bit of reggae. Going. It just keeps on going. Yeah. But people have been good. In the beginning, they thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And we showed them it wasn't. And then people who never came to Cabana started coming mm -hmm. because they'd see the pictures. They'd see yeah. the food. You know, we have excellent partners in O&B who work with us, who gave us an elevated menu, and um, people started to come. People who'd never been there before, families. Mm -hmm. uh, the place is, I want to say, five days a week, yeah. five nights a week. It's very hard to get a reservation. All right. And I think the city has matured yeah. where something like this happened. I don't know if we could have done this five years ago. <gasps> But the city has matured definitely. Okay, so then that's Cabana. That's one part of the complex here. Now, Rebel, what have you guys done or planning to do with the Rebel side? So right now we're waiting for the city to tell us mm -hmm. what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now the, um, the parameters are 50 people inside, 100 people outside. I think that might be a personal thing, like mm -hmm. you having 50 people in your home as a party or if you're, you know, for a funeral or whatever it may be. So we, we just have to wait for clarity. And mm -hmm. I think they've pushed it back stage three mm -hmm. till this week. So stage three has said that basically restaurants are able to open inside okay. with distancing and uh, in those areas that are not affected. And then in those areas, I think it's just York and Toronto that's not able to be in stage three. Mm -hmm. People have people inside in a restaurant and they're able to do that with distancing. And once that happens, our intention is to do something very similar to that inside Rebel. Um, one of the first things we'll do is every year for Super Bowl, we do a Super Bowl party. We okay. show the Super Bowl, we have food, we turn it into a sports bar. So that's the first thing. I mean, yeah. you know, our Raptors are back, defending champions of uh -huh. the NBA. Uh -huh. People want to write us off, but <laughs> we got a surprise for them. And we've been the longest running champions longest. ever in the history Thank of the you. NBA. Right? You get it. Give them some props. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the Raptors are starting this week, mm -hmm. and the Leafs are also starting this week. Yes. And playoffs will start shortly afterwards. So what we're hoping is that we're going to have a sports bar inside. But more so than that, um, because I talked to you about vision, mm -hmm. more so than that, what else are we going to do? It's not just sports. It has to be something else. And so there's a lot of conversations now thinking about doing something where almost like a dinner theater thing. Okay. And what can we do for dinner theater? What can we do so people, just like a dinner and a show, dinner and a movie, dinner and a show, what can we do to, to, to put this together yeah. uh, for it to make sense. And so there's a lot of people at the table now who are putting it together. And I, you know, I'm, I've said too much already, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's the plan. We have space mm -hmm. and that's the great thing. We have a lot of space. I can socially distance, and I can socially distance people in Rebel mm -hmm. because it's the biggest license in the city. Yeah. I've got space. I've got that balcony that oversees where I can put you in a separate balcony, separate from everybody else. I can put, um, 
dividers, plexiglass dividers between people as they're seating in booths so that it makes sense. That's what we've done outside and that's what we'll do inside. Um, I think that the great thing is if there's a silver lining in any of this, yeah. it's definitely for us and I think several other people have seen that there's other aspects of their business. We will not... If next year goes back to 100% normal, yeah. we will still be doing cabana, waterfront, patio, restaurant during the week. Yeah. Because it's been an exciting, successful venture. People love it. People have enjoyed it. You know, and if this dinner theater thing works inside, mm -hmm. you know, one of the biggest issues is that nightclubs tend to be in prime real estate, yeah. in prime areas of the city but it's only used Fridays and Saturday nights. It stays empty much of the week. Crazy. It would be an amazing situation if now these spaces, ours and other people's spaces, can be used during the week to do other things. Mm -hmm. And if those things make sense, I think this now has given everybody the, the chance to try to reinvent themselves and look at other ways to do things. Look at other ways to get together socially. Mm -hmm. Some people will never be interested in being in a crowd of 3,000 people again. Ever again. One of the things that we've seen and heard most during this time is older people. Um, and by older, I'm saying people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who have enjoyed coming out to a cabana with their wife or their kids and having dinner. This is something different. And this gives them something to do. You know, one of the things that I hear most of all from my friends, I mean, I'm, I'm a 53-year-old man, so yeah. my friends are in their 50s, late 40s. Uh, you know, me and the wife have a babysitter this weekend. Where should we go? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know why you're asking me. <laughs> because I mean, you're the operation manager, probably. Yeah, but you as a 50-year-old man probably yeah. don't want to come anywhere that I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's a lot of 23-year-old kids. Yeah. But now I think that... This will give people an opportunity to look at doing something else. Mm -hmm. If you have that space and you have that club downtown and all you wanted to do was try to have bottle service and people dancing, I think now you've seen that there's another demographic that wants to go out on Friday, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday night, mm -hmm. and they're looking for something different than people dancing to loud music. People are willing to spend money, they're willing to go out, they're willing to do something different, and hopefully this gives everybody an opportunity to reinvent themselves because the club industry has never shut down. Yeah, okay. This has never happened. There was prohibition at one point. They stopped the sale of alcohol. Yeah. But they still kept it open. Yeah. They had speakeasies. They did their thing. 9-11, the clubs were open on that weekend. SARS, the clubs were open. Okay. The clubs never closed. The numbers dipped. Yeah. 25%, 30%. People mm -hmm. stayed home for a while. The clubs have never closed. This is the first time entertainment has shut down. It's the first time that restaurants have had to shut down. This is the one business that has never been affected. When there was a recession, mm -hmm. the business did not shut down. Because even when people don't have money, mm -hmm. they want to go out and celebrate some way, somehow. Yeah. And they'll take that money they have, and they'll come out for a night. This is the first time. So now we have to know that we have to be prepared to do other things because we can shut down. Yeah. If the second wave comes, there's going to be an issue for a lot of people. We have to reinvent ourselves. Definitely. And since we're talking about reinvention, I know you guys have a brand new venue called the Drive-In. The Drive-In. Let's talk about that and how that even came up and what made you guys say, okay, you know what, let's go for this. And how long did it actually take you guys to put this together? So... Truth be told, we saw it happening in the States. Okay. I don't know if it was the States or Europe that did it first, mm -hmm. but there were a couple of people who did it. I wish we could say that we came up with it, but we saw other people doing it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we saw that, we knew that we had to get it done also. Mm -hmm. The reality is this. We're ink entertainment. Um, we are leaders in this industry. We're leaders in the city. And if somebody's going to do something like that, we've got to be in the forefront. Yeah. The drive-in cannot make money. It's impossible. It's impossible. How so? 
the amount of money it takes to put together what you see there, mm -hmm. we would have to be booked three, four times a week. Okay. But because the decision was made in May, yeah. you can't get the bookings because, as you know, you've done events, you yeah. got to book people ahead of time. Artists can't come into the city. So everything we do has to be Canadian. Yeah. And there's just not enough Canadian artists to fill up that space three, four times a week yeah. for the next three months. So that's in the parking lot right now. It's sitting there. It's not doing anything. And now we're getting bookings. But once again, mm -hmm. to get three, four bookings a week, you have to be way ahead of the curve. Nobody's ahead of the curve. If we knew in March we were going to do this, then we could have booked stuff. Yeah. But last minute, people love the idea. They're scrambling, but there's only so much you can scramble. And so Charles wanted to do the drive-in because people were going to do it. We have a parking lot. It's right across the street. Mm -hmm. We have the ability. We have some good partners um, that were able to work with us and help us kind of put it together. We've got some film festivals happening. Uh, we've got some great concerts. Uh, you know, the Division concert was yep. your Division concert, right? Uh -huh. um, we talked to those guys, and they came together with their team and with Rap Season, um, and they talked, they talked, they talked, they looked at it, and they decided to go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one sold out pre-sale, pre -sale, the second one sold out pre-sale, the third one sold out pre-sale, and they said, hey, maybe yeah. we should do more. Yeah. And from my understanding, uh, there's four or five that are now sold out in a row. So. It's a bit crazy. Okay, and I've seen um, Dr. J also has Soka or Die coming to the drive-in. So originally we had planned to try to do something for this coming weekend, mm -hmm. Caravana. It's Caravana weekend. We're, oh my, listen. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so crazy that it's Caravana for some strange reason completely went out of my mind. Isn't it nuts? Come listen, and Caravan has been my thing professionally for the past 24 years. You know how many years they haven't done Caravana? <laughs> Zero. One. One. This is the first year they haven't done Caravana. <sighs> this is what it is. We have to think about doing things differently. Mm -hmm. So, we talked to a bunch of people, and, you know, we were trying to get stuff for Caravana Weekend, but once again, this came to fruition two and a half, three weeks ago. Yeah. It didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. The idea was to try to get it done for this weekend. It didn't make sense. We couldn't get it done. Jay decided to do something later in August. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure if people are going to be interested, if the community was going to be interested. Because, you know, part of the biggest problem is this. You have to stay in your car. Okay. You have to stay in your yeah. car. Okay. You can't get out of the car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you look skeptical, okay. Sheldon. You look skeptical. What's that? Why? Why are you? This is a bit concerning for me. Anyway, okay. Uh -huh. You have to stay in your car. All right. So you have to dance in your car. Okay. You can't get out of the car. It's gonna. You know what it is. Listen, I think right now people are willing to try almost anything because. If you've been down for three, four, five months, you're going to say, okay, clearly I can't go on a fet and go do what I want. I can't go to a concert, go do what I want. So they're doing a drive-in. Let me try that at least. Absolutely. If you said that to me six months ago, mm. I'd probably look at you like you're crazy. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. Nah. Now, today, totally different story. Absolutely. Wow. And so, I mean, Jay is not doing a party. He's doing a concert. So hopefully that is going to get people to kind of Follow it, and if they do it well, maybe there'll be two or three more of those bad boys. But, um, I mean, he, he released it yesterday, and 15 minutes in, he called me and said that, uh, look at this, and there were already uh, 855 likes, and there were 95 comments, and the engagement has been crazy. He mm -hmm. sent me the numbers today, and it's insane. And he hasn't released the artist. He hasn't released what he's doing yet. He's just yeah. teaser. You know, so... It's exciting, and, uh, you know, we hope we we're able to do many more of them, but, um, yeah. Yeah, well, this is welcome to 2020. Yeah. You know what I mean? And especially, you brought up one thing. This is going to be the last thing I'm going to ask before I get you out of here. Caravana, which is one of you guys' biggest weekends. All right? How are not you Not one. Guys? Not yeah. one. Biggest weekend. Caravana is the biggest weekend. Biggest weekend. Nothing beats Caravana. Because Caravana also falls on Veld weekend. 
Yes. Which is one of our festivals. Yes. There's no weekend bigger. What are you... What are you guys going to do, or how do you guys ride out this one? Because, again, as you said, Veld, everything happening at Rebel, the other spots. How do you guys ride out this type of storm? On Saturday, I'll put on some Kess. <laughs> I'll follow it up with some Tiesto. One little tear will fall down my eye. Oh, man. And we keep on rolling, because... In the end, the reality is that we can't think about this year. We have to think about the next 10 years. Yeah. It's a long-term vision. Mm -hmm. It's not short-term. Yeah. It's a long-term vision. The company is here to last forever, mm -hmm. and, uh, or as long as it can, and um, we're going to be here. We just have to make sure that we get better at what we're doing. Yeah. You know, that, is, that is the onus that I've put on my, my team. Uh, that is what Charles has given us to work with. We've all got to get better. Mm -hmm. How do we get tighter? How do we get leaner? How do we make sure that the things we do are more successful mm -hmm. so that, once again, you can have something on the side in case this thing happens? Yeah. Nobody can control this thing, but you can control how you react to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're busy doing now. Um, busy making sure that we're ready no matter what the situation and, um, you know, that's what it is. And right now, things change so quickly. It's not like, okay, six months down the road, this is what's going to happen. No, six days down the road, Absolutely. this is what's going to happen. I think that there's nobody who watches uh, CP24 now more than, like, CP24 viewership must be up every Monday. The mayor, the, sure. the, the prime minister, <laughs> the, the premier, they're talking. Everybody's lo yeah. Everybody in the industry, for sure. It's crazy. Is just watching to see what's going to be happening and mm -hmm. what's being said, you know? And um, the reality is that we all have to do things differently and we have to prepare. Mm -hmm. And as you said, yes, it's four days from now, something's going to change. You have to be prepared. And if you're not prepared, mm -hmm. there were several people who had patios yeah. who were not prepared when they said, open your patios. And they missed out on business because they had to wait. They wanted to wait until the decision was made. Yeah. And, and you can't do that. You got to move. You got to move. Move forward. Wow. Do you think there's going to be the industry when it comes back? Do you think there's going to be a lot of promoters and a lot of event organizers like we had before where that's going to pivot also? And do you think they're going to have to now add a live streaming component into the events moving forward now? As I said, I think that there's definitely going to be a situation where less people will want to be in big, heavy crowds, mm -hmm. at least in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think, as I mentioned earlier, the people who do business well mm -hmm. and who are professionals will survive. The guys who are doing it just so they can get a bottle, <laughs> get some likes on their Instagram, uh -huh. they're going to move on, mm -hmm. you know? Um, there's guys in this business that this is what they do. This is how they pay their mortgages and pay for their kids' bills and send their kids to school. Mm -hmm. Those guys are going to survive. Those guys have always survived. Yeah. They know how to do business. And then there's guys, like I said, this was just fun, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with it being fun. We can't have everybody be a professional in this right. business. But as long as you're not trying to fool everybody else saying, hey, I'm a professional and you're really here for fun. Yeah, yeah. Play your role, tell us what it is, and we'll be okay with Listen, it. Listen, I hope everybody had another job. That's what yeah. it comes down to. Yeah. Like you, you you need to, if, if, if you just work on a monthly party or you just work on a weekly where somebody's giving you $7 a head in a bottle, I hope you had another job. Or you saved all those $7 for a long, <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. You said, um, I'm going to save this for the past five years. And then, yeah, because right now, I'm telling you, a lot of people that went in, they're not coming out the same it's, as it's, they went in. It's and they shouldn't. They should. Mm -hmm. None of us should come out the same. Mm -hmm. You know, things are different. Everything is different. We found out stuff about ourselves, mm -hmm. about each other, you know, um, Hopefully, everybody got to spend more time with their family, mm -hmm. their significant others. And, and, and you know, we, we found out stuff about ourselves. We found yeah. out what was important. Mm -hmm. We found out what happens if, if stuff gets scary. Yeah. You know? And I think that that should make everybody stronger. It made me stronger. Yeah. You know? Um, it made my family stronger. And uh, I, I think that once you have that and you understand what's important now, mm -hmm. hopefully everybody's priorities have just shifted a little bit. 
you got to save for a rainy day. 1,000%. You know? Everybody heard, everybody's been told, oh, you should always have enough savings to last you for six months if you lose your job. Nobody has six <laughs> months of savings. That's craziness. People barely have six weeks. That's They're craziness. talking about six months. Yeah. Right? Six months? That's yeah. madness. Yeah. But now we know what they mean. Now you know what they meant. Yeah. So if you had six weeks before, mm -hmm. maybe you got to bring that up to 12 weeks. Yeah. If you had two months, you got to mm -hmm. bring that up to four months. Yeah. But now you know that it's a serious situation mm -hmm. because everybody was losing their jobs. Yeah. It wasn't just this field or that field. Everybody was in a situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unemployment only pays so much. Doesn't matter if you're making this much. Unemployment only pays you that much. Yeah. Can you survive on that? And I think that's what everybody is finding out now. And everybody's got to, if this happens again, nobody can say they were surprised. That's true. You know, our government has done, I think, a very good job at taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody can say they're surprised anymore. Yeah. And um, if me in my position, I found myself scanning the wanted ads, yeah. looking to see if Loblaws was hiring, because Loblaws was hiring when everybody Listen, was firing. You know, you know this. You know, you know this. I was looking to see what Loblaws was doing. Then you should be looking to see what yeah. you can do also. You understand. That's, that's true. That's facts, man. Mr. Bristol, it's always a good time whenever we connect. Absolutely. If anybody wanted to check out what's going on with Inc. Even check you out personally, hook up with you. Professionals want to book the venues or whatever, whenever they come back, leave some contact info. Listen, the best bet is to go to the Inc. Entertainment website, um, which is uh, IncEntertainment.com. Mm -hmm. That has all our venues on there. It has our contact information on there. And you'll send an email. And even if it's not directly to me, because... Some people don't like me. I don't need them to send me stuff directly. I just, you know. <laughs> Needs I, to be not filtered. Not everybody's my friend. Needs to be but, filtered. But, but you can send that email and it'll get to me if yeah. you're interested in doing whatever it is. I mean, right now, I've had some people send me messages and say, hey, we're looking at renting. We're not doing anything right now. Mm -hmm. The reality is that if you're looking at renting the venue for Next Caravana, we're not going to answer the email because we don't know what's happening Next Caravana. Yeah. If you're interested in doing something in uh, the drive-in, Absolutely send it, and we can have that discussion and see what the parameters are. But once again, yeah. I'm not renting the drive into somebody who can only send me a flyer that they did at a restaurant that moved their tables across. It doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. It won't make sense. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I think most people know how to reach me. And, and if you don't, you can find somebody who knows how to reach me. I'm very able to reach. But, but that's it. It's, it's inkentertainment.com. It has all of our venues on it. You'll be surprised the things that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we run three festivals. We have venues all over the place. And, um, you know, that's us. Trust me. I remember the first time I went to the um, office, I think, on Bloor Street. Mm -hmm. I was thoroughly surprised. It was just through a little, little door. But you see, after you push that elevator and it open. Totally different ball game. I was convinced ten thousand percent from there. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's legit. Orion, thank you so very much for actually coming out of your office and coming to mine because thank this is something advice. special. Thank you for the invite. You understand? Sir. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle, and this has been another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast, and we are out. This podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusichut.com.